see my screen? Yes. All right, thank you very much. So first, uh, I wanna thank Evgeny for putting together this excellent program and, and for including me on it. Um, I appreciate that very much. Um, so uh, as for my particular task here on the program, which is discussing this paper by Simon and Ye, um, you know, I actually found it a little bit challenging. And the reason for that was that it's an extremely well-executed uh, model. On, a, on, a, on an important topic. And so because it's well executed, it's actually a little bit difficult to, to, to I think, poke at, 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 at anything that they're doing. Um, but at the same time, um, given the importance of the topic and given that, frankly, when it comes to stable coins, I don't think that uh, it's so well understood in let's say lay circles. I think there are lots of misconceptions, lots of basic questions that people still don't properly understand. In, in practitioner circles or even just any just outside of this set of researchers at especially conference like this, um, that the well-executed paper on this sort of topic actually has an opportunity to sort of not just provide a ton of content and a lot of you know important results, but to sort of be a workhorse model, to be influential. And that goes to something other than let's say the substance of the paper, which I think is you know, I think you can tell from the from Simon's presentation. There's a lot in it, and it's very well done. Um, but but this goes into more um, really the only comment that I that I have in this presentation, and, I, and I'll dig into it, um, is that I don't think it's exactly written for a general interest audience at this point in time, and and that's a shame because I think it has a lot to say for people who may not attend a conference like this, but nonetheless keep on hearing about stable coins, whether it's because of Facebook or because of Tether doing something nefarious. Um, and, and, and this paper has a lot to say even for that audience. And I think attracting that audience might be able to sort of increase the impact. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that was probably clear from Simon's presentation is that there are, the, the base model itself is quite rich, but there are a number of refinements that, that, that Simon and Ye go through. And if, if you read through the paper directly, you see that they actually start getting into these refinements relatively quickly. So section three introduces the model, which is a non-trivial model. Section 4.1 basically solves the model exhaustively. Um, but by section 4.2, they're talking about governance tokens. By section five, they're talking about user collateral. By section six, they're talking about Facebook and you know involving big data. Um, so it's a lot from the reader's perspective. And, and while those are all you know um, very interesting topics in of themselves, I think there are some really basic questions that, that their model does tackle, but they don't really emphasize enough um, the, the, the value that the model is providing there. Um, and so actually I'm gonna show you a little bit of what Simon showed you, maybe 1% of what Simon showed you, but with, with a little bit more emphasis um, uh, on why I think um, uh, these results are, uh, are worth digging into. And in particular, why it's worthwhile to sort of weigh in a little bit on, for example, the things that, that we see for um, the things going around in, in, with regard to say Tether or USD Circle. Um, of course, notwithstanding the fact that um, Tether is not an over collateralized stable coin, but that's actually, I think, important in and of itself. So what do I mean when I say that, that I think it, it could be repositioned a little bit, at least in early on in the paper to, to sort of dig in to some of these uh, questions that even people outside of the sort of specialty researchers on blockchain would, would be interested in. So the, the first thing I think a lot of people ask about stable coins um, is just like, are they actually plausibly stable? Is, is there, you know, is, is, is this some, some people may frame it as, you know, is this a scam or, or is, does it have some serious uh, legitimacy behind it? Um, and, and so Simon showed you this picture in his, in his presentation um, where they have an analytical result that basically bears this out. So, so the model parameters here aren't really that important, but on the x-axis, we have the state variable, which is uh, the level of, I mean, the excess reserves. And on the y-axis, we have volatility. And as Simon said, basically, when the excess reserves are sufficiently high, you actually have uh, stability. But when they, when they go below that threshold or go below some threshold, then you no longer have stability. Now, the important thing here, which, which is briefly touched upon in the paper, is that this is an over collateralized stable coin. So even when it's under that threshold, um, it's still, it still has excess reserves. So if you think about, for example, coming back to Tether, they, they insisted for a while that they were backed one-to-one. -one. 
Um, and I think USD Circle still sort of takes that position. And I, I suppose the reasoning there was that, they, 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 that, that if they are back one-to-one, -one, then they should be perfectly stable. But really what Simon and Ye are doing is that they, they have a much richer con context, a much richer concept of how the world operates, which is to say that um, the stable coin operator, um, even when they are excess reserves, it may be incentive compatible for them to debase the currency. And so it may not be stable in that case. So when, when Tether, for example, um, or when they wanted to insist that they were back one-to-one, -one, in some sense, they're sort of missing the own, they're missing the dimension of the fact that, of their own incentive compatibility, right? Um, that, that, and that's why, for example, that when, when there is even some, some excess reserves, you can have uh, uh, the stable coin below par. Um, so that, that's, in, in effect, this, this point just by itself is very different than the context, I would say, that, that generates um, these stable coin operators trying to convince people that they're back one to one, because they're in some sense ignoring the actual economic aspect which Simon and Ye are getting at. Um, but sort of, a, you know, a, a related point to that is, you know, many people seem to think that for example, if a stable coin doesn't hold parity, that, that, that could be some kind of you know, uh, uh, fatal event. But another thing that arises in, in their analysis, which is another graph that Simon showed you, um, is that in their model, of course, when the stable coin loses parity, it does eventually reattain parity. And, and, and there again, I think there's a difference in the framework with which as economists, we think about it, which Simon and, and Ye have made rigorous versus the way it's thought about in practice, right? So in effect, it's, 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 the, the stablecoin operator is controlling the volatility of the asset in a way that is incentive compatible to the stablecoin operator, right? So when, when, when they get a series of negative shocks such that, the, uh, such that the excess reserves fall too low, it becomes incentive compatible for them to even allow this stablecoin to, to no longer be stable, to have a little bit of volatility, even though it's, it's bad for the user base, that's incentive compatible, but just as there can be a few shocks that sort of, you know, reduce the price of, uh, there can be a few shocks that reduce their excess reserves. Um, there can be shocks that push those excess reserves back up, and then of course the stable coin would regain uh, par value, right? Um, and so I think you know, this sort of way of looking at it is is a bit different than how how it's frequently looked at, at least in practice. Um, and and this is an important wrinkle um, that that they bring in, and and it really leads you to I think think about stable coins not so much in this binary way of if they're stable or if they're not, but rather in thinking about them uh, through the lens of something like their uh, stationary distribution. So I think Simon showed you the stationary distribution for the state variable. I'm showing you the stationary distribution for the price. So if I'm buying a stable coin, essentially, look, it's, it's not gonna be stable all the time probably, um, but, but if it's stable with high probability, that's probably something that's, that's worthwhile to know. Um, and, and here in this case, separate from the, the, the previous slides I was showing you, um, here the model parameters do matter, right? Because in the previous slides, those are, those are essentially capturing uh, analytical results in a picture. But here you can start to think about, you know, what exactly would generate a stable coin being relatively stable. Um, and they have a very nice model from which they can think through these things, even without getting into things like uh, big data. Um, and, and that is actually something that I, that I would have liked to see a little bit more discussion in the context of, you know, the stable coins like Tether and Circle and so on. Again, realizing that Tether is, is not over collateralized, um, do, there, do, 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 do the results have anything to say for that? Do they have anything to say for any of the other stable coins that, that are sort of in that traditional framework where you don't have a centralized operator like Facebook, but, but, um, but, um, but maybe a, an entity that's more in the crypto world. Um, and so there's, I would say the, the discussion in the paper is fairly dense and it would be useful to pair some of these sort of very high level points with, with how it relates to sort of these existing stable coins out there and whether there's a way to think about, you know, which of them are more likely to be stable. Um, and, and even sort of thinking forward, one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading this, you know, you can issue a stable coin on different blockchains, of course. In fact, you can issue the same stable coin on multiple blockchains, which is what, for example, Tether does. But should I think about the model parameters differently across, for example, Ethereum or Cardano or Solana? If I'm, if I'm thinking about the, these stable coins that are out there in practice, how do I think about um, their different levels of stability? And how do I think about what, let's say, if I wanted to issue a relatively stable coin, where should I be issuing it, for example, right? Um, 
now kind of a related point here the 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 endogenous variables in the model for the for the uh the operator of the stable coin include you know the dividend policy for themselves the fee policy for themselves and the supply um are there are there anything is there anything we can infer for example from what we see of these policies of existing stable coins um it would be it would be useful i think to sort of relate it to uh, that related to the, the the universe of crypto tokens, more or stable coins, more so. And you know, I noticed, for example, I think you know, Tether is referenced, of course, but it's it's. I think there are like two places where it's referenced in the footnote. Uh, USD Circle, I don't think is uh, is referenced, but it would be useful to sort of bring it in, uh, bring those in uh, more more uh, more in the main discussion. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about actually, I was I was reading this was the state variable, of course, is observable in the model. Um, but in practice, for a lot of these coins, it's not right. Um, uh, they'll occasionally go do an audit, but but um, but it's not actually observable, certainly in dynamic uh, in dynamic dynamic context. But that's it doesn't that doesn't need to be the way that it is. Meaning, because because of blockchain technology, because you can actually have, for example, the reserve asset being a crypto asset, you actually could sort of implement it in sort of a more direct way, I guess, by having a, by by using. Um, some other crypto assets as the reserve assets on a live blockchain, um, and and you know I hadn't I hadn't thought of that sort of framework until I read this paper, and I, I wonder actually whether, um, given that you know it's it's not a story where stablecoins are doomed, at least how I read it, um, uh, and and because of that, I, I wonder whether there is potentially some value to transparency because I feel like when I think about Tether and I think about Circle and so on, there's not a lot of transparency. Um, but in effect, you're showing that in a in a case where it's totally transparent and the operator is acting in a selfish, you know, economically incentive compatible way, there are still there's still good outcomes that can arise out of this. Um, and so this is actually very different than, for example, trying to hide your reserves off chain and and you know maybe even lie about what their level is. This you can create this transparency using blockchain technology. So let me uh, quickly conclude here. Basically, from the actual technical aspects of the paper, from the uh, from the depth of results, you know, I think it's an excellent paper. Um, but I feel it's a little bit dense at times, uh, and and I'm a little concerned that 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 level that that way of sort of laying things out might cause readers who would otherwise be very interested in trying to understand what's going on with stable coins, um, maybe it, it might cause some of them to turn away. But this this could be of you know interest beyond blockchain researchers because of the relevance of stablecoins and because of how well executed the model is. So I'll uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, thank you, Fahad.